You've probably heard by now that some doctors claim viruses don't exist. When the average person hears something like that, the first thing that comes to mind is probably that these doctors have gone mad and don't know what they're talking about. It must be a conspiracy theory. If you think about it a little, you'll understand that it's impossible to prove the existence of something that doesn't exist. So in this video, we'll prove that these doctors aren't crazy and that viruses really don't exist, but not by trying to prove the unprovable. Instead, we'll completely discredit the fake methods that official medicine uses to prove their existence. It's important to remember that we're talking about something that's supposedly measured in nanometers, which the human eye can't see. In other words, the story of viruses is the story of an invisible entity. To better understand what follows, let me start with a story. Imagine a bowl full of mixed nuts. It contains walnuts, almonds, hazelnuts, cashews, Brazil nuts, chickpeas, peanuts, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and pistachios. Now imagine a person, let's call him Mark, who eats the contents of that bowl and then breaks out in a rash, saying, my dad was allergic to peanuts, so it's probably the peanuts that caused my rash. Is such a scenario possible? Of course it is. But can we be completely sure that Mark's rash was caused by peanuts? Of course not. Okay, so how do we find out if Mark really developed an allergy to peanuts? There are two methods, and I'm sure both are completely clear to you. The first method is for Mark to eat a little peanut again the next day after the rash goes away. The second method is for Mark to remove only the peanuts from the bowl and eat everything else. If the rash appears again, we now have proof that Mark really is allergic to peanuts. Okay, but what if Mark doesn't get a rash after the first method, but does after the second? I believe it's clear to everyone how to determine the real cause of Mark's allergy in that case. However, if it's still not clear to you how to do it, this video isn't for you, and I suggest you go back to watching that football game. To talk about the non-existence of viruses, we'll use the fake pandemic of a virus called COVID-19. Here's how it all started. At the end of 2019, a COVID-19 pandemic was declared. It was declared by the World Health Organization after a group of Chinese scientists supposedly isolated the C-19 virus from the tissue of several patients and published a paper on it in the well-known medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. This study talks about how they isolated the virus. You'll find the link to this study below in the description of this video. The study begins with a summary of what the scientists did. In December 2019, the illness of a group of patients with pneumonia of unknown cause was linked to a wholesale seafood market in Wuhan, China. A previously unknown beta coronavirus was discovered using unbiased sequencing of samples from patients with pneumonia. Human airway epithelial cells were used to isolate the new coronavirus named 2019 NCoV. The words you don't understand shouldn't worry you. All that's important here is that the scientists took a tissue sample from sick patients which they believed had to contain the virus, then conducted lab analyses in the usual way, and at the end of the study wrote that they discovered a new virus, classic medical forensics. To discover a virus, a scientific medical forensic procedure must be followed. Such a procedure has existed and has been used for the past 100 years and is called Koch's postulates. Koch's postulates state that, to paraphrase, what is being sought, in this case the virus, must be clearly identified to be claimed to exist, so it must be visible. Specifically, it must first be proven that the virus is present in every diseased organism. It must be isolated, that is, separated from everything else that exists in the sample, and preserved in a pure environment. When what has been isolated, a pure virus and nothing but it, is introduced into a healthy organism, that healthy organism must fall ill and have identical disease symptoms, and the virus must then be isolated again from it, which must be the same as the originally isolated one. It must also be proven that the virus entered the first infected organism from the outside. None of these steps must be skipped by the lab workers because otherwise, we do not have proof of the virus's existence but only a theory of their existence. All of this is completely clear and logical. The only problem is that the virus is visible only with electron microscopes. So those of us who do not have access to them can only take their word for it. Shall we believe them? No, we won't because they have been flagrantly lying for 100 years. Here's how you'll understand that they're lying. Look at the first sentence of the last paragraph of the study. 
Although our study does not fulfill Koch's postulates, our analyses provide evidence implicating 2019 NSOV in the Wuhan outbreak. Oh, really? So they have no intention of using simple medical forensics in the form of Koch's postulates, which is the main condition for the study to have scientific value, but instead, they are trying to do it with some analyses. This is ridiculous. Okay, let's see what kind of analyses they did. Their story goes like this. We took samples of infectious material, which, in the most banal terms, means they stuck a swab through the patient's noses, twisted it a few times, and pulled it out to then place the cotton swab in a sterile container. Okay, it was not a cotton swab, but a pipette because the samples were taken from corpses, but later in practice, it was done with cotton swabs. You know how they do it. By the way, if any of you have never had this done, accept my congratulations and sincere admiration. You see, already here, we have a problem that's not mentioned in the study. Medical equipment is sterilized with ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is a poison. Google it and check it yourself. True, the amount of this poison will not kill a person, except maybe those who diligently took swabs for three years, three times a day, and washed their hands 50 times a day. But what do you think will happen to the virus when it comes into contact with something designed to kill it? That is, to kill everything pathogenic and create a clean environment? This is ridiculous. After that, they did a great thing. They added a liquid to the container, as they said, for virus transport, mixed it a little, and then placed everything in a centrifuge, which was supposed to separate the virus from all the other collected cellular material, blood, mucus, etc. The pores of the centrifuge are such that only something the size of a virus and nothing else can pass through them. And now, of course, everyone expects the scientists to exclaim, Eureka! Here it is. Unfortunately, you predicted poorly. Instead of simply presenting the new virus to the public, things got more complicated. So, in the liquid that accumulated on the other side of the centrifugal pores, which they call the supernatant, there should be viruses, only viruses, and nothing but viruses, and this should be clearly visible under the microscope, and that part of the story should end there. And then they should move on to the next step of Koch's postulates, injecting the virus into healthy people. However, our Chinese brothers never did that. What do you think? Why not? When they search for bacteria, which are significantly larger than viruses, they do this same step. But the supernatant immediately goes under the microscope, where it will be clearly seen how the bacteria float freely in the liquid. They even make video recordings of it, and there are plenty of such videos on the internet. So it remains perfectly unclear why they didn't inject that supernatant into a healthy person and wait to see if they show symptoms of the disease. Let's get back to viruses. The supernatant liquid was then applied to respiratory tissue taken from lung cancer patients, confirmed to be uninfected. They divided it all into separate chambers, which they then exposed to some special water-air process for four to six weeks. Later, during this whole spectacular exhibition, several different substances were added to everything, all of which are pure poisons. Do not be lazy. Look up their names in the study and search for them on Google by adding safety data sheet next to the name. Poor viruses. What did they do to them? Now the story becomes even more interesting. After applying the supernatant with all the added poisons to the human tissue, a piece of lung, they observed under the microscope whether it began to show signs of pathogenic changes, that is, to fall ill, simply put. They say it shows cytopathic effects. And guess what they noticed? The tissue indeed began to fall ill. Oh God, of course it will fall ill. This is totally ridiculous. But that was not enough for them. So they then picked up that sample and inactivated it for two hours with 2% paraformaldehyde. Come on, do not be lazy at least now and check what paraformaldehyde is. To make it easier for you, there is a link below the video. What on earth is this super poison doing to our poor viruses? But alas, the story does not end there. This entire super poisoned team was then subjected to ultra centrifugation, probably to knock out the viruses to make it easier for them. If you thought they finally took pity and placed everything under the microscope to see the viruses or what was left of them, you are seriously mistaken. The crime against viruses now reaches its climax. They added another seven poisons. Don't believe it? 
open the study again and read the text in the transmission electron microscopy section from the third sentence to the end of that section. Each and every one of them is labeled as hazardous. Check it yourself. So again, go to Google, type the name of the poison, then add safety data sheet. If I were a virus, I would have filed a genocide lawsuit even before that centrifuge. At this moment, the famous phrase about some vaccines being made from inactivated viruses comes to mind. You've probably heard that, right? Inactivated. Only inactivated? Oh, how nice that sounds compared to this massacre. And then they finally placed everything under the microscope to understand the genome of the virus they had never seen. This is how scientists' analyses look like. And all they had to do was to place the first supernatant under the microscope and make photos and video recordings, and then perform all the steps of Koch's postulates. One thing is very important to note here. Look, that final sample they eventually placed under the microscope contained all sorts of things. This is written in the study. However, they claim that it is the virus from that heap of everything that caused the disease of the lung tissue, do you still remember the story about Mark and the peanuts? But okay, let's now assume that this is indeed the case and perform a cheap trick called a control study in their scientific world. In the entire history up to today, only two independent control studies on viruses have been conducted and both yielded results that their fake science was not satisfied with. The first was conducted in the early 50s and the second a few years ago by Dr. Stefan Lanka. But wait. What is a control study at all? This is very important, and listen very carefully. In a control study, everything is done identically to the original study, but the sample of infectious material believed to contain viruses is not added to the process. So we want to know if that tissue would have fallen ill without the virus sample, just as Mark removed peanuts from the bowl to find out if he was allergic to them. Do you know what happened in those two control studies? Yes, you guessed it right, the tissue fell ill. Trust me, our Mark would have done a better job of isolating the virus than these Chinese clowns. What you see here are the graphical results of the control study conducted by Dr. Lanka. By the way, in 2011, he offered a reward of 100,000 euros to anyone who could provide him with a study that scientifically proves the isolation and existence of the measles virus. Young Dr. David Bardens brought Lanka six studies, which he himself had not read, claiming they proved the isolation of the measles virus. The case ended in court, where the German Federal Court of Justice, FCJ, on December 1, 2016, completely dismissed Dr. Barden's lawsuit, declaring all six studies as unscientific, like this Chinese one on the isolation of the C-19 virus. Many other studies were conducted on the isolation of the C-19 virus after this first one, and all these other studies were conducted like this first one, on the basis of which the pandemic was declared. But do you know what is tragic? Such laboratory studies have been conducted for about 70 years since the discovery of the electron microscope on literally all other viruses, and they all yielded the same results. We discovered the virus, believe us. Look, for example, at what the polio virus looks like. But wait, shouldn't they be the same? Or at least similar? Absolutely ridiculous! Okay, let's now move from the lab experiment to an in vivo experiment to prove the existence of the virus, despite the fact that no one has ever isolated, seen, or characterized it, especially not infected a healthy person with it. Because the fact that it has not been seen does not mean it does not exist. Remember, the virus is invisible. So how is this done? In fact, it has already been done, but no one ever told you. Below this video, you will find a link that leads you to a study by Dr. Milton J. Rosenau, and the famous but forgotten The Rosenau Experiment from 1918, a study in which Dr. Rosenau tried to determine the transmission paths of the Spanish flu virus, which is claimed to have killed between 50 and 100 million people. After this and a few other similar unsuccessful attempts to prove that the disease is transmitted from person to person, no one ever tried to prove it again. Everyone also somehow forgets the historical fact that during World War I, the population, especially soldiers, were massively vaccinated against smallpox and typhus. Does it now become clearer what killed so many people? But let me ask you something now. When you see dead fish belly up on the surface of the river, will you think they died because there was something in the water that killed them? Or maybe because they caught the latest fish flu? 
papaya, goat, quail, Coca-Cola, motor oil, fruit juice, chicken wings, you name it. They were all tested PCR positive for the COVID-19 virus. Yeah, I am absolutely sure this poor fish would test PCR positive for a novel COVID-24 SARS fish belly up virus. All that official medicine today deals with is the ridiculous theory of the existence of viruses and infectious diseases and the necessity of vaccination, which I must admit is one of the most profitable frauds of all time. If you still believe that people get sick and die from viruses and not from lethal vaccines against non-existent viruses, from permanent poisoning with poisons abundantly put into your drink and food and sprayed from planes and drones, and most of all from the daily press and TV and radiated abundantly with harmful electromagnetic devices, then maybe it's the right time to supplement those first four COVID-19 shots with at least another one because you never know.